Yeah. Okay, uh, moving along. I, I'm looking at a uh, little odd here, a, a golf ball. You're looking at, Herb, yeah, a golf ball. It is a golf ball um, with nails, small tacks sticking out of the nail, uh, sticking out of the golf ball, about uh, half half an inch sticking out of the ball. And so the, the golf ball is covered with these tacks that have been hammered in, sticking out all over it. That is attached to a chain, which is attached to a short piece of wood about eight to nine inches long, uh, which serves as the handle. So in fact, that is a replica of an old medieval mace that was caught in this country. Now, as you see that, um, what you have to... It'll do some damage. It'll do some damage, but the whole crux about that particular thing, Herb, is that was made by an eight-year-old child. Speaking of children. Yeah, eight-year-old child who's, unfortunately, their par the parents allowed their children to watch pornographic and sadomasochistic films. So the parents are out one day, so the kid goes into the... Um, into the video unit in his house. He puts, takes a video out, and it's one of these S&M videos. He puts it on, watches it, and he sees this on the film. So he goes out into the workshop, and he makes himself one. Mm -hmm. And that first came to light when he was in the playground at his school, hitting other children in the playground with it. Okay. What was the outcome, and how was the child? Well, the outcome, the outcome was we, the child is eight, so he's, uh, he's below the age of criminal responsibility, so he commits no offence, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so we take the child back. Uh, to the parents with the social workers and we asked the parents you know do you really think these are the sort of films that uh, an eight-year-old child should be watching mm -hmm. and we were told to mind our own business it was nothing to do with us um, they're broadening his outlook on life right. okay uh, a crossbow I'm looking at a crossbow a more uh, conventional weapon and we know it's a uh, deadly and what about this what's the story with this crossbow yeah that is was... it a crossbow I guess yes it is it's a handheld crossbow so it's the smallest it's small one. very very small one um, I suppose we're talking about overall length about 18 inches uh, mm -hmm. the width about the same across the string mm -hmm. um, hand held like more like a pistol when you look at it it just looks like a re uh, a revolver or a pistol or something like that but it in fact on the top it is a crossbow um, you can buy those in this country we don't restrict those and they're totally lethal um, and that was used in a murder in West London about five years ago where a lady shot another lady who had taken her boyfriend from her and so she lay in wait and killed her with the handheld crossbow Love is uh, love can be uh, rugged. <laughs> oh yes, that's right. Yes. It can be it can be a wonderful thing, but it also can be love can be very, very uh, and as they say. Yes, that's okay, right. uh, uh, now over here, this uh, this this uh, thick uh, uh, length of rope, I guess, with a ball on it. What is that? It looks like a leather. This yes. looks deadly. Well, it is. It's a very very thick rope. Uh, the rope is about uh, about two inches thick, and the end is knotted and then coated in black leather. Um, these these were used by dockers when we had before we had containerization at the docks, mm -hmm. and when t cargo was packed in the hold of a ship, uh, dockers would carry those for knocking the boxes. Just if they was well, wasn't quite in the right position, they would just knock it mm -hmm. with that with the box to move it in so they could pack all the other boxes in. Um, quite a legitimate object, but as you can see, uh, tremendous. If you feel it, it's very very hard and very very wow. thin. Yeah. And of course, they were used for assaults. They were used, and in fact, that one was used for a murder. Yeah, so one must have killed somebody. One docker murdered another with it yeah. by heading him over the head with it. Yeah. But it's an innocent object, just used in a bad way. Okay, so we're moving along now, and we're kind of moving uh, uh, to a, through the table here, and uh, going to our. Uh, and uh, what is this all about? It looks like a flashlight patrol light. Well, this is yeah, this is a patrol light. Uh, it's just a, uh, a four-cell large torch. Um, which is a torch, the batteries are flattening at the moment, but it does, that button there um, makes it into a torch and just gives out light. If you press the other button, what it does, it turns the whole thing into a stun gun and all the metal, as you see around the light there, and all the metal at the end become electrified. And mm -hmm. That pushes out 50,000 volts. So if I now press that button and touched you with it, it would give you 50,000 volts through you. Is this a uh, police weapon or did somebody, uh, was this used in a commission of a crime or it's just here? It looks like it's more of a police weapon. No, it's not a police weapon. It's something that we purchased, not in this country, they stun guns. Um, handheld stun guns, as you see, that you see in your country, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, stun guns are banned in this country. We have banned them. Right. We will not have them in this country. We have banned the making of them. We've banned the sale of them. We've banned the possession of them and the importation of them. So it is totally illegal to have one of those in this country. You don't have to be doing anything with it. Just mere possession is a criminal offence. Right. But, of course, they are quite openly on sale in the United States. They're openly on sale in Europe, France, Germany, Holland. 
and so people go across for a day trip to France and they can buy them. Um, very few people get stopped coming back into the country, so we see them pouring over here, but they are totally illegal in this country. You'll be able to go by train yeah, come the fall. Absolutely right. Now, that's 50,000 volts. You said now the, the normal stun gun, where's the voltage there? Yeah, well, that's, that's 50,000. Oh, so it's 50,000. That one's 50,000. This, this particular one here, we're now looking at one that looks very much like the small umbrella um, with, a, with a handle on the end. And somebody walking down the street, as you can see her, but that would look just like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. But then when you take the cover off the end, it is inside... It's a stun gun, and that is 105,000 volts, mm -hmm. that uh, German stun gun. Totally illegal over here, but mm -hmm. again used in this country to attack somebody. Right. Okay, who is Frederick... Denning, he looks rather, uh, he looks a bit deadly here. Deming or Denning? Frederick Deeming. Deeming. Uh, Frederick Deeming, uh, there was the death mask of Frederick Deeming there. He was a man who lived in this country uh, back in the 1890s. Um, he then emigrated to Australia. In Australia, he, he was charged with murdering a lady, and what he did, buried her in the kitchen, and then cemented the floor over the body. Whose um, kitchen? Hers? In his own kitchen. Um, in fact, he was brought back to this country and actually did the, he'd had done the same thing with his first wife in this country. Who um, is this woman to him in Australia? This was his, uh, the, the wife he'd begun to be married. Mm -hmm. um, and he was found to have done the same thing to his wife and child over here and buried them under the kitchen floor and then cemented it over. And he was brought back and he was hung. He was a famous, he was famous in the 1890s because as he stood on the steps of the gallows uh, to die, and just, be, just, as they, just as the hangman was to pull the lever to send him to his death, his last words were, I am Jack the... Then they pulled the thing. And it was always said that he was claiming to be Jack the Ripper. Which, of course, Jack the Ripper was about three or four years earlier than this in London. Um, but as far as we're concerned, that's all rubbish. That was just sensationalism. It's just uh, braggadocio. Right? Yes, that's right. As far as we're concerned, he was not Jack the Ripper. Okay, moving along, I'm looking at a pair of uh, shoes with the toes cut out. The what? What is that? What are these shoes? Well, they're a pair of leather shoes with the toes cut off. And as you can see here, there's about two lumps of wood sticking out of where your feet go in, sticking straight up in the air about uh, 18 inches. Um, nothing sinister in this, but that was so they belonged to a man uh, back in the 1800s, and he was a burglar. And he was quite a good burglar, and he would burgle country houses. Um, but he had enormous feet. And he took a shoe. I don't know how your American sizes go. In our, in our English sizes, they would be a size 15, which in probably in our continental terms would be a size 50. Um, but I don't know how American sizes go. Big feet. Yeah, he big feet, certainly big feet. <laughs> um, and of course, every time he did a burglary, he left, walked across the grass or across the earth to leave the scene of the burglary, and he left these footprints. And of course, the police officers came along, saw these enormous footprints, and immediately guessed who it was, went round mm -hmm. his house and arrested him. So he then took to taking another pair of smaller shoes. He cut the toes off to make them looking smaller. And then he left, every time he left the house, he left a false trail of small footprints so that when the police came along, they wouldn't realise it was uh, him that had actually done the crime. You caught him anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, we caught him. The last, the last time he did a burglary... But for a guy with frostbite. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last time he did a burglary, he came out of the window and he came backwards across the lawn, leaving, across the grass, leaving these small footprints, but there were two policemen standing on the pavement behind him who arrested him. Yeah. Uh, no bizarre. Yeah. Okay. Around, the, around the top herb, above the great weapons, stories. Above the weapons, as you can see, there are a lot of death masks on a shelf above, in the, d in the gloom. Um, and there's 37 in here of these uh, death masks. The ordinary white plaster of Paris, for some reason, they p always painted them brown to give, make them look more sinister. And they're all death masks of murderers that were hung in London. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a belief in the 1700s, 1800s, there was a criminal type. Mm -hmm. um, a look. Yeah, a look about it, the old Lombroso theories of criminality, the eyes being too close together and all things like that. But there was also a science taught called phrenology. And phrenologists believed in lumps on the head. And if you had a lump in the head in a certain place, it meant certain characteristics. Um, and they all believed that murderers would have a lump in the same place. So the authorities took death masks of all the people they hung for a certain period of time, gave those death masks to phrenologists in the hope they could study them and find there was a common lump. A common lump. Yeah, but it was all turned out to be rubbish. Um, but that is actually why, why they were taken. Wow. Okay, so, uh, and everybody appears different uh, here. I mean, there's no yeah. commonality here, really. Everybody, the eyes set in. Well, the only uh, thing I didn't is like... Is an ear missing? I don't know if that's... Well, then, no, that's, uh, that's just been knocked off afterwards. You know? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, moving along beyond the death masks, uh, we're looking at some rather uh, horrid, um, horrid um, 
police photographs here and one of these yeah these these photographs here have are they uh, they are the victims of jack the ripper um which um, i'm sure um most people have heard of because he is one of the few uh murderers mass murderers uh, serial killers that travels internationally he's the he, first media darling as it were absolutely yeah probably one of the most He's probably famous because it was probably one of the first sexual serial killers that was acknowledged. Um, and secondly, I think it always, to anybody in the world, it, visit, it conjures up visions of Victorian England and cobbled streets and gaslights and swirling smog and men in cloaks. And I think it conjures up that Victorian image that people like. Um, because really, he only killed five people. And in terms of... He was really a small-time guy. Very small-time, when you consider some of the big, you know, serial killers we've had in the world. Right. And you see, most murderers do not travel internationally. When I say that, um, people in your country, like recently Gacy, or somebody like uh, Dharma, or Ted Bundy, mm -hmm. um, very famous in the States, but to be perfectly honest, never heard of over here. Most people in this country would never have heard of any of them. Mm -hmm. Most people in Europe would never have heard of any of them. Mm -hmm. um, because murderers only stay within their own, being usually famous through in their own country. But no artifacts left from Jack the Ripper and we just have the five uh, victims, Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Liz Stride, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Jane Kelly. The first was Mary Jane Kelly, was that right? No, Mary Jane Kelly was the last one. She was the last, uh, the last victim. The only one killed in a room and it was a total, total mess, as you can see from the picture there. It was a total evisceration of the body. It, She's lying in a bed, but this one is standing. What is her name? Who is this? That is Catherine Addoes. Um, Why is she standing? Do you really want to know? Sure. Uh, <laughs> She's standing. She's nude. Well, she's nude, um, and you can see she had been ripped. But this is a, a photograph taken in the mortuary after the post-mortem examination, um, and you can see. Can you can make out a line going from the throat down to the pelvis, uh, where in fact she was ripped open from throat to the pelvis, right down the middle, right of the down the middle between the between breasts. The breasts right. um, but in the after the post-mortem, they had sewed her up again, so it's actually been sewn back up again. Now in those days. They wanted a photograph, and you could only you couldn't take photographs from above of somebody lying down. They were very static cameras. So unfortunately, what they did, you can see if you look on the photograph, her feet aren't touching the ground um, because they they hammered a nail into the wall and hung her by the neck, just to put her neck on the back of the nail, and then photographed the body just to get a photograph. Which of is almost as terrible as well the body, not nearly but well that the, they it is a body the, the body's dead the post-mortem examination has been done um mm. it is more like a butcher's shop in these circumstances isn't it you know the body is dead right, uh, right. but there's something uh, well, and down below here is that also one that's of another picture of catherine eddowes she's laying she's down here lying down there right. yeah uh, I've only heard, like watching in Star Trek, I've only heard of Mary Kelly, uh, the the way she was when the when the police came in. But looking at it here, it it just doesn't even begin to describe the the the, the bloody. Uh, well, it was a total mess. It was a total evisceration of the body. He was. This was the only murder done inside a house. She's faced up. She's faced up, lying lying on the bed. Um, Looks like the legs are spread there. The legs are spread. Well, what he'd done, he'd severed the head from the body. So he'd cut the head completely from the body. He then skinned the face. Both breasts were cut off and lay on the table here. Mm -hmm. He then opened her from the throat into the groin and from the knee into the groin along the leg. And all the internal organs were taken out and then flung around the room. The, the entrails were draped around the picture rail and it was just a total bloody mess. And we're looking at letters, my goodness. We're looking at letters here. This is uh, Jack, uh, Jack the Ripper uh, sort of uh, teased a bit and here are some of the letters of tease I guess well Lee says uh, this is a copy um, of a Jack the Ripper was known as the dear boss letter uh, which was sent after the second murder mm -hmm. um, suppose and it was the first time the, the word Jack the Ripper was penned